So we're back, Bo Hashem. We didn't have any shirim last week because I was ill. And Bo Hashem, it took me a few days to get back to normal. And now we continue in the Kuzari. We are in the third treatise and on section number five. So we're talking about prayer. We went through this in somewhat detail. And he says, the rabbi says, in the same way that the body requires sustenance, what's the sustenance for the body? Sleep. Sustenance is sleep. No, usually we're talking about food. Sustenance. But yeah, I guess sleep could. Usually, yeah, you need sleep, you need food, you need drink, you need a few other things, right? No pictures. And in the same way that the body requires certain things, so does your soul. And one of those things is prayer. That the, the nefesh requires this as part of its well-being. And there's a lot of opinions or a lot written on something called alienation. Right? Karl Marx wrote about it, about being alienated. Alienation, essentially, how I'm using it, is that a person feels that something's missing, that he feels different, odd. Move two seats. So that way, yeah. So that way somebody can sit in those seats. Good, yeah. There are a lot of people around the world that seem to be searching for something. And if you look at just a survey of world cultures, whether it's in China, whether it's in India, whether it's in the Middle East, whether it's in the Western world, which we're more familiar with. But there seems to be a certain constant in human civilizations. They all end up with a concept of ultimate reality. That's a term that Paul Tillich came up with in order to include all of the religions in all societies. So it doesn't really matter whether you're Aztecs or Native Americans or Egyptians or Babylonians or Zulus, whatever it is. We see that there seems to be a uniformity among human beings, that they all are searching for ultimate reality. In the Western world, we call that God. And in many native religions, they also call that spirits, or gods. Or in Buddhism, it's a little bit of a, you need a little bit of a massage to get it to work, and that's why they use the term ultimate reality. Which means that human beings recognize that the physical world is not everything. There's something to human existence that is beyond physicality. Where does that come from? It seems to be a universal. It seems to be something that people around the world, no matter where or when, search for it. So then you say, OK, so what's going on in the West? We're seeing that the West becomes more and more secularized less and less, less and less spiritual. So you have to understand the origins of that idea. In the West, spirituality is relegated into two areas. Okay, it's, it's pushed into two areas. One is music, and the other one is art. That's where you can express this sort of spirituality. 
in Western secular world. But that's a very, very different view of how Judaism looks at spirituality. We say that any action could be spiritual. Your eating could be spiritual. Your drinking could be spiritual. Even getting drunk could be spiritual. Even intimacy could be spiritual. That is, nothing is sort of isolated to say that's the only thing. And we see that what Rabbi Yudha Levi is telling us is that for a person to feel whole, to feel that really he is a complete person, not alienated from the world, the same way that the goof, that the body requires sustenance, the nefesh, the spirit, requires also development. You have to invest in your nisham. And part of that investment is prayer. Now, we should know, I get that prayer is very difficult to do. Because it requires knowing what to do. No, it requires a significant investment of concentration. And there are people who will tell you that I do it, but I don't feel anything. I'm not getting anything out of it. And so therefore you have to figure out what's wrong. Why aren't you getting it? You have to understand that that's not something that is natural to people. Especially when we grow up in a world that is very secular. Prayer seems to be silly, a waste of time. You could do something more productive. And so that requires a lot of work and practice and investment. Okay. Now he says that the farther a person is, gets from the time of prayer, then the darker and darker your spirit, your nefesh becomes. And why is that? It's because the nefesh is being burdened by physicality. But all the stuff that happens in the world you need to make money for rent. You need to worry about food. You need to worry about this. You need to worry about that. Getting married, not getting married. What about this one? What about that one? My parents, my mother, my sister. All of those sort of things that are piling up, they bring this sort of cloud on your Charlie Brown neshama. And so... The more you spend time with children or women or bad people, you're going to be around ideas that are going to cause your nefesh to be dragged down. Whereas if you spend time with people who are elevating your neshama, then the effects of physicality of the physical world, or what we would call people would call reality, you can get less and less influence. That's why a lot of people, when they come to yeshiva, they do very well. When they go back, all of a sudden they start tanking. And the question is, why? Well, it's very simple. Here you're surrounded with spirituality. You go from class to class. Right? Some people will say you get pounded with spiritual messages over and over and over. And when you get to your room, you have your roommate and you discuss spiritual things and then, you know, you eat and then you shower and whatever it is and you're all constantly thinking about this. Whereas once you leave the yeshiva in the real world, if you don't make an effort, lat lat, slowly, slowly, you get farther and farther and farther. To a point when you start doubting, like, maybe it's a cult over there. Maybe there's Happy Light Institute business. There's a cult for brainwashing me. And now I can see the truth. 
My friend, maybe it's just the opposite. Maybe that's the brainwash. Maybe here you can actually think clearly. At least be open to that possibility. No? And so, if you're surrounded by unclean speech, people who curse, use words that a person shouldn't use, they're talking about topics that probably shouldn't be discussed, it leads you to lose control. And so that becomes more difficult for you to pray. But he says that during the prayer a person purifies his nefesh of all the things that happened to it. So just imagine, when was Shachris for you? So let's say you dive in Shachris at 7.30 in the morning. And you were done by 8.15. Let's just say, 8.30. Okay? All right, now it's 3 o'clock. How many hours are going to pass before you have mincha? From 8.30, make it to 3.30. Don't make it. I don't want anybody taking your... 7 hours. So how much 7 hours do you think your, your nefesh sort of was affected? Yeah. Well, some people had Gemara classes today. Other people didn't have it. <coughs> okay. But the point is that tefillah prayer is about purifying your nefesh and preparing it from this point forward. And in a sense, without getting into Kabbalah and, and what's really the processes that are happening inside, I like to think about prayer is it gives me a chance to refocus my attention. When you are living your life, sometimes you lose track of what the vision is, what the mission is, what your goals are. You're caught in the moment. You're doing this, that, the other, answering phone calls, answering emails, doing this, doing that. Prayer is about, wait, this is why I do what I do. There's every blessing in the Shema Nesrei is to help me focus. What's the number one thing that I should be thinking about? That Hashem bless me with chokhmah, bina, vadas. Right? That I have wisdom, understanding, and knowledge to what? To serve Him. What's the second? What's the third? What's the fourth? Each one will tell you, every bracha is telling you, these are the things that you should be thinking about. Health, your personal health, but also your family and your friends and people that, are, that need prayers. We don't just pray for ourselves, we pray for the entire Jewish people. That's the idea of prayer. And he says that in this order, it is impossible for the entire week to go by without the body and the soul being affected. And therefore, if you did not have Shabbos, you just keep piling on and piling on until you actually crash. But he says Shabbos is a day where after six days, you get to stop, you get to refocus, you get to provide both your body and your spirit a chance to rejuvenate, a chance to reset. I used to say control alt delete, but people don't know what that is anymore. You mean control panel? No. Taskmaster manager? No. You have to reset. Shabbat is about resetting. You get to sleep. People tell me how much they wait for Shabbos because they could sleep X amount of hours. Good. Bo Hashem. What? Why are you so smile? Why are you so happy? I agree. You agree that's the purpose of Shabbos? No, that was, I uh, agree. Okay. 
But that's if that's your own Shabbos, that's the pleasure that you have. You should. should. Okay, good. So, we also have in our cycle every month a Rosh Chodesh. Rosh Chodesh these days, unfortunately, doesn't take a lot of uh, center stage. Yet, it's a very, very important day because it's time of atonement for all of our actions. It's like a mini Yom Kippur. Without fasting, hoodie, you don't have to fast. Why would you miss that opportunity? And so he says, it is a particular day that provides us refuah, healing. Every Rosh Chodesh, you get the Rosh Chodesh, there is healing, spiritual healing for you. Because of that Rosh Chodesh. And you're supposed to have a suda for Rosh Chodesh. Let's leave that question for when both of our beards grow long. I think the, the easy answer is you have a sitter, you have the words, you should mean what you say. And say what you mean. And then we also have the three holidays. Pesach, Shavuos, and Sukkot. And we also have Yom Kippur. So each of these are leading us in order to get ourselves to remove the effects of the physical world. But he says, and that's the way to connect the different actions that are known. That's how he ends it. It's a very cryptic statement. Like, what does that mean? And the king asks that of the rabbi. What do you mean these actions that are known? He says, look, if you look at the mitzvot, the 613 mitzvot, we have actions that are chukim. What's a chok? something that seems to be a decree without a logical explanation. Good. Then we have laws that are social, regulate social behavior. For example, be nice. Just be nice. Don't kidnap kids. Right? That's always the contradiction. In Israel, people are rude, but kids are safe to run around. In America, people are polite, but you can't let your kids out because they get snagged. It doesn't make any sense. Right? It doesn't make any sense. What? <laughs> so, and then you have rational. So you have certain mitzvot that are known. But then there are a whole new category that he calls Masim Elokim, divine actions. Okay? And he's going to get into this right now. He says these are specific commandments given by us, by God to us, because he's leading us. And they provide us guidance of how to live. He says even more so that even when you have rational commandments, there's commandments that make sense. For example, not to steal. Right? That's a rational. I don't want anybody to steal from me, so I'm not going to steal from anybody else. And we're going to make a rule that we all agree that you don't take my stuff and I don't take your stuff. 
Sounds fair, no? And so he says, even laws such as those that regulate social behavior or rational behavior, he says they are not known in perfect in completion. We don't really have a good understanding of quantity or quality when we apply to these commandments that we're going to see. So for example, we know, for example, that we have to have a karata tov. What's a karata tov? Gratitude. Gratitude. What were you going to say? Appreciation. Gratitude. Yeah. But is there a limit to gratitude? Hoodie, is there a limit to gratitude? Yeah. What's the limit? Um. Also, we already know that a person should fast. Are there minimums? Yeah. Their maximums? Yeah. If a person says, I want to fast from now until the end of time, <laughs> is he allowed to do that? Probably not. No, of course not. Not be dumb. You want to hold on two Yom Kippers, right? Because maybe the first one's a suffix, you're going to hold two days. You allowed to do that? No. Why not? Your whole two days of sukkahs, right? So you should hold two days of. Uh, because Rabbi said so. What? Because Rabbi said so. That's it. That's it. That's it. That is it. So whatever the rabbi says. Yeah. And if they say it's a different day of the month, even so they know it's not, you follow the rabbi. Uh huh. Okay. Which rabbi? Sometimes. Any rabbi? <laughs> no. Based in. Is there somebody behind the pole? Yeah. Who? Okay, let's look at and I'll give you another example. Everybody knows that deception is bad. To deceive. But is there, at what point do we say this deception is now beyond all, or is it any little deception? Deception is necessary. Deception is necessary. Good. What about if you're going on a date? You look beautiful. Right? Or you see the girl that's, uh, you know, a little uh, on the gordita side, and you say, wow, all this for me? <laughs> you got to be nice. Uh, what? Which week? This week? is double partial. We know also that being, treating our, behaving with women in a hefker manner, like they don't belong to anybody and I don't belong to anybody and just hefker, you know, go over here, go over there, go everywhere, right? Shmuel? We know that that's bad, that one should not do that. And we know that having certain physical contact with relative girls that are our relatives is also you're looking at me like you're going to family reunions to meet girls what, what was that look <laughs> what are you from Kentucky it's like rabbi that's half of my business <laughs> Okay, but he says we human beings cannot establish boundaries for these things. 
we rely on God to provide boundaries for us, to tell us what is mutter, what is aser. That the Torah, as the Word of God, defines those parameters for us. It defines what murder is. It defines what thievery is, a theft. Human beings cannot establish limits or boundaries, quantities, qualities. That is coming from Hashem. And he gives an example. Circumcision. No visuals. Sit down. <laughs> It's not a show and tell here, Azriel. Does this count, Rabbi? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He, what? So he says circumcision is something that is not rational. It's very far from reasonable. I don't think people will sit on the couch and go, you know, I got an idea. You know what we should do? <laughs> and really it hasn't any, doesn't really have any social role. But we find Avraham Avinu went against his nature at 100 years old, circumcised himself and his sons. And therefore we see that this was the sign of the covenant, Ot Habrit, that allows for the divine power to connect to that person. So the king says, you know, yeah, you're right, I mean, Accepting this mitzvah and fulfilling it, usually in public, with a lot of people and an explanation, and there's a bracha, and all the nations that try to copy you, did not take on circumcision. Do you think he needs you to correct him? Maybe. He says that those who decided to copy you, so even though you, most of the, let's say, the Christian world does not circumcise itself, so then Azriel says, oh, well, the Muslims. The Muslims received only the pain of circumcision, but not the blessing of circumcision. Because that covenant was promised to Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov, and that's how it continues. What? And he says... The rabbi says to the king, he says, look, there are nations that try to copy us, but they were unsuccessful. He says, let's look at the other nations who have established a day of rest for themselves. Christians establish which day? Sunday. And the Muslims call it Friday. Okay, you're yelling Arabic words out of nowhere. Why? It is called Jum'ah. What does Jum'ah mean? Friday. So he says, but if you look at those days, they have nothing to do with Shabbos. They don't even understand the concept of Shabbos. They don't have a concept of Shabbat. 
And he says, the way that they copy Judaism is the way that, li- that images copy a live human being. If you make a statue, does it copy a human being? Not really. Are you ever confused from a statue to a live human being? Now, don't give me an example of wax museum. But, that, but even, even that doesn't look real. So says the king, when I think about your condition, I saw that God seems to have a secret as to maintaining or keeping you in the world. There really isn't any reason why we should be around. Think about it, Hoodie. There's every reason for us not to exist. Just like hundreds of other nations that existed are completely gone. And what happened to them? You never find like an Aztec going, hey, those were the good old days. Or an Inca, you know, or a Mayan, or an Egyptian, or a Babylonian, or a a real Roman, or a real Greek, a Syrian. Those were much greater people. Yeah, Egyptians are gone. But we're still here with the same text, with the same... Tzitzit, Tfilin, Shabbat. Still hoping to get back to the temple and have a good old barbecue. I mean, you know. We've been doing this for all close to 4,000 years. And so he says that Shabbos and the holy days that God gave you are the strongest re-causes for you to maintain your nature and your, your values. Because even when nations divide you and they conquer you and make you slaves, and they do that because of your wisdom, and the purity of your minds, and even make you into their soldiers. But they all they would have made you that, but because you maintain adherence to Shabbat and Yamim Tovim, that is what preserves us. At some point of your life, you're going to have to answer the following question. Do you want your kids to live a meaningful Jewish life? You have to ask yourself that question. And if the answer is yes, then the question is, okay, so how do I guarantee or stack the deck that my kids will live a meaningful Jewish life. So the first thing we say, well, we have to make sure that they marry Jewish. Okay, so for them to marry Jewish means what? That you have to marry Jewish. If you end up not marrying Jewish, that's going to be a bit of a kasha. Hey, marry Jewish. Well, you didn't. Got up. Do as I say, don't do as I do. Hypocrite. What? So you have to make that decision. So what's the number one reason that people marry Jewish? It's because they're in a place with a lot of single Jews. Simple. If you go back to Ukraine, for example, where 
you know. It's not full of Jewish Jewish girls. It's going to be hard. So even if you're very committed, you're going to have to move. People always ask, Rabbi, should I move from Wyoming for Shiduchim? Um, yeah. Wyoming, man. Where should I go? Go to Omaha, Nebraska. <laughs> there are more Jews than Wyoming, but... <laughs> then what? It's fine, so we got that. We, got that. we understand that we need to be in an area where there's a lot of... But if you create boundaries between you and the outside world, between you and the Gentile world, those boundaries are going to help your children maintain their separate identity. And how do you do that? Two. There's two things. Kashras and Shabbos. Kashras means that you're going to limit them hanging out and eating. And Shabbos, you're going to take care of all the sports and all the cheerleaders and all the, you know, all the other stuff that goes on. Shabbat is going to help you to have a meaningful Jewish life for your family. Now the challenge is to grow beyond the no. What do I mean by that? For a lot of people, what Shabbos means, don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, no, 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 no. So yeah, if it's no, 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 and that's how you look at Shabbos, then yeah, I guess that would be very tough to keep Shabbos. But once you get beyond the no and you understand that, you know, this is what Shabbos is. We have an amazing meal. We have friends over. We have time to sit and relax and talk and play with the kindala. Changes the whole situation. When you're single, Shabbat is hard. I get it. Right? Because, all right, you go to a Friday night meal and you're done, whatever it is. Now what? So, okay, you go and you, go, you fall asleep. You go to sleep. Okay, you wake up and now you have the entire day. Doing what? Shachris, fine, good. Baruch Hashem. Meal. Meal? Oh, meal, yes. Okay, then you ate your chulant and now it's exactly 12. Sleep. How many hours? Until somebody wakes you up for mincha and eat again. Okay. So, okay. That's where you have to invest in your Shabbat. And remember, winter is going to come. You're going to be done in your meal by 7. You're not going to go to bed at 7.30. Even if you do, you'll be up at 6.04. Like this. What time is the minion? 8.15. <laughs> and then you start moving in your bed, trying to wake up your roommate, and then he... And you start timing his breathing and snoring. And then you look at the pillow and say, maybe I could stuff it in his face, and he'll be... <laughs> no, Aaron, never cross your mind? Mm -hmm. Good. Do yoga. Do yoga? Yeah. What's pshat? What do you mean do yoga? How would a body pose help you? It's 6 a.m. when your roommate is snoring. It helps you meditate. Ah, you want to meditate. On what? On you using the sounds of his... Yeah. <laughs> That's it. And then when he's nearly choking to death because of the... 
sleep apnea. Mincha, gentlemen. <laughs>